I hope everybody is doing well, staying healthy and happy. One note, it did not even register on me until it was mentioned to me this morning about my topic. This is a non-political topic. It was not intentionally done blue. So just so everybody knows that was, that was completely unintentional on my part. So I'm gonna go ahead and get going. Looking good, Mark. All right, we'll go ahead and jump on in. I know if, if you've traveled or um, you know to the West Coast or to some more northern areas or England, you know you see a lot of these phenomenal blue plants like that uh, we can't grow, like the delphiniums with these really nice true blues and excuse me, yeah, delphiniums, you know, or out in the garden like this, or the mechanopsis. People travel to China, Himalayas, just in order to grow. I know one person east of the Mississippi, east of the Mississippi, who has managed to grow one of these blue Himalayan poppies to flowering size. And that was somebody who had an old a root cellar on their their property. It had been under a, a cabin. The cabin was gone, so it was just this deep hole. And he amended the soil in the bottom and and managed to grow blue poppies down at the bottom, where it stayed quite a bit cooler than the the rest of the surrounding area. But for the most part, getting blue flowers, especially true blue, is is pretty difficult in the garden. You know, there's Sometimes horticultural blue is anything but blue. You know, it's often lavender and purple and violet. And so, you know, blue has always been kind of this, you know, something really desired in the garden. People think, you know, we talk about blue roses and you see those dyed blue roses in the, the grocery store or dyed blue orchids. But even way back, one of my favorite authors wrote a poem about blue roses, gathering blue roses. And, uh, you know, it's a kind of a futile quest to try and to try and get those those blue roses. I love that. Rudyard Kipling, love his love his stuff. You know, and, and like I said, a lot of times you kind of get these lavender colors, but, you know, Sometimes it's really just just begging for it. I don't know. Blue dream. I don't I don't know if that's really what I would call blue. That more of a dream than blue. You know, or this uh this daylily. I guess if you squint, maybe there's a hint of blue in there, but not much. Now Floragene, which is now, it's all these companies, these plant companies always get bought up and everything. Now it's, I believe, owned by Suntory. But they set out back in 1990 to create a blue rose. That was their goal. And so after about, I can't remember if it was five or 10 years in, I think after five years, they isolated the gene for blue. And another five years went by and they managed to get it into carnations and came out with a series of blue carnations. Now this is from their website. So, you know, they're bragging about these blues. I don't know if I would have called any of those blue and I'm pretty much stuck on, you know, the, the eight pack box of crayons. So I, I don't, you know, the different shades are kind of all the same to me. So, you know, they, they are very proud of these. After 20 years, they did develop a blue rose. This is the first, it was the first genetically modified ornamental plant that was available for sale. I don't know if it's even made it to the U.S., if it's available in the U.S. I know it is in Europe. 
and it's the Suntory Blue Rose Applause. And just look at that. That is, I'm embarrassed to even show this as, a, as an employee at NC State. I mean, that is what, that blue is halfway between Duke blue and Carolina blue, right? It's blue like the sky or the ocean. You know, I this this really cracks me up that they that this is the blue rose that that they developed. That's as close as as they could get. I don't I don't think when people talk about wanting a blue rose, this lavender thing is really what they're talking about. So so blue is a tough one to get. There there's really not really much in the way of of blue pigment in any plants. Uh, the closest pigment is something called delphinidin, which gets its name from delphiniums. And that's about the bluest pigment as opposed to the, the reds uh, of, and oranges, uh, you know, of like beta carotene and the yellow xanthophils and, and those sorts of colors. So uh, it, it's tough. Now, so the blue that plants get either are either from a combination of, of pigments that mimic some blue or often from the from minerals they pick up or some interaction of those. So that's why hydrangeas turn blue in acidic soils is because they're, that's the, the aluminum iron ions that are, that are expressing that color. But, but blue is tough. So we'll go ahead and talk about some. Now I'm not gonna just talk about blue flowers that we can grow because true blue flowers would be a pretty short talk. And I'm not gonna talk about some of the ones that everybody knows about. I'm gonna talk about some, some maybe some different things, but also talk about you know blue foliage, blue fruit, and, and kind of hit on a few different things. One that I really, I, I probably showed this in, in one of my midweeks with Mark, so you may have seen it, but this ajuga called bicon, which has really about as close to blue uh, flowers as, as we get in, in good temperate plants that tolerate our humidity. It loads itself with blue flowers in the spring, and then later on in the season, um, you get this great variegated foliage. Now you can grow just the straight ajuga incisa, in which case this would just be kind of green. But I think this really uh, shows off and it shows off that blue really well as well. And it's a heavy flowering plant. It really does well. Another little blue plant and one that you can kind of see its, its relationship with forget-me-nots um, when you see that flower. It's got that, that same kind of look as a forget-me-not, but these real pale flowers on this plant, Trigonotus omiensis. I don't think it has any kind of common name, but it's a neat little plant. And even when it's not in flower, the foliage is kind of silvery blue with these dark veins running through it. We found this to be a real easy plant to grow and, and propagate. I, I really, I've really kind of fallen for this plant. I think it's a neat little guy. Uh, just flowers in the spring, and then it's kind of just nice, interesting foliage the rest of the season in a kind of shady wooded spot. Um, and some other plants that we grow regularly, erysemas. Uh, there are quite a few different erysema species that have populations in the wild that have kind of this silvery wash or, or sheen over the leaves. This is one that, that I collected in Taiwan that's growing in our lath house. And every plant, every one of this Erysema taiwanense in this population that we saw had this, this real silvery look to it. Also had relatively short drip tips on the leaves. You might be able to see kind of right here and right here, these drip tips. In some Erysema taiwanense, these tips will go all the way down to the ground. They'll be 8, 10, 12 inches long hanging to the ground. But 
you know, the flowers are kind of interesting because there's kind of snake like jack in the pulpit flowers. But the foliage, you know, when you surround it with, you know, there's a nice green um, rhododendron and a, a canthus over here, they really pops out there. So if you had a good dark green ground cover under there, like this mondo grass, dwarf mondo grass under there, it would even pop even more, which I just love that, that color. Is it blue? It's certainly in sky blue, but that silvery kind of blue, minty green blue um, is, is often what you get with foliage on plants. Another one with kind of that same look is this Camanthus face japonica or Leucoceptrum japonicum, depending on your taxonomist of choice, Ginsenko nakafu, which has a silvery leaf, kind of a white margin around that silvery blue, and then a darker green blue um, margin around it as well. It's another one that by itself, it's, it's bluish, but when you start surrounding it with other plants, like the gold of this Akuba ubanakafu or this impatience that's around there, it really starts to, to pop and show off a little bit better. I'm going to move some plants around in my garden. This is one that was from my garden, but I have brought a whole bag of cuttings into the arboretum and I, we have a great crop of these going in the greenhouse now. I, uh, I'm going to move some of the uh, dark leafed syningia beside it. So I get that really dark green behind that silver. I think that'll be quite nice. And, you know, kind of another, well, or kind of a tropically looking one. I actually think this would look really nice with that silvery erysema. This is another erysema, but not the silvery one. This is Colocasia phalax, which is a clumping, spreading, uh, hardy Colocasia. It's nice and short. It's, it's not like a great big elephant ear. It only grows about maybe 18 or 24 inches tall. Those, the leaves are, you know, maybe eight inches or so, a little bit larger if it's really vigorous, but they had that that blue center and veins on there. If you really want one, let me know. I may have extra, I may dig them out of my garden. It's, it spreads a little faster than I want it to and where, where I have it now. Um, but it's a great garden plant. Always looks nice and cheery. And when you get some other dark leaf shade loving things around there, it's great. But also just by itself and a little bit of shade, it, uh, it really brightens up. It reflects that light, which I like. And it kind of plays off the blue. I, I, I got to get one of those silver erysemas. I don't have any of my own at home, so I need to track one of those down. Go back to flowers. Uh, there are some good blue flowers. Amsonia. This is one called storm cloud. The Amsonia hubrechtii is one we talk about a lot. That's the real fine leafed Amsonia. It's one that J.C. Ralston really, really loved. For me, the the flowers on Amsonia tab, uh, uh, hubrechtii are just so pale blue that they kind of get lost. This um, Tabernay Montana, there's an extra T in the middle of Tabernay Montana, that shouldn't be there, have a slightly deeper blue, but still that pale sky blue. But on storm cloud, they're held on these black stems, which sounds like something that you wouldn't pay any attention to. But I'm telling you, if you put this right next to just regular Amsonia Tabernay Montana, you'll really notice how much more blue this seems um, on those stems and um, all the little pedicels in there. Really, really am fond of, of this plant. It's quickly becoming my favorite Amsonia that I grow. And of course the columbines, you know, for whatever reason, the blues tend to come out better in, in cooler areas. This is a Aquilegia cerulea is a, called the Rocky Mountain columbine. This is uh, from a series uh, called Kirigami deep blue and white. Um, there's another one, Kirigami light blue or pale blue and white that's a little bit lighter colored. But, you know, it's funny if you look at pictures of this, even on our own uh, website, pictures taken of the same plants, often very close to the same time. You know, this one is pretty blue, but you'll see other ones where it looks much more lavender. It, it really, uh, how the light hits it very much affects it but love these little, um, these long spurred columbines. I, uh, I had a very influential boss when I was uh, a young gardener who hated, hated these long spurred columbines. 
and for years I kind of echoed her and you know that something about them was I don't know cheap and tawdry or something I'm, I'm not sure what she had against them and that she um, passed on to me but I have come to the realization that these are simply incredible flowers and I love the columbines I love growing them and I love that they kind of seed around my garden a little bit and pop up here and there I love our native ones the the Aquilegia canadensis but some of the some of the Asian and and high elevation ones like this are truly truly spectacular to me and the irises there are a lot of irises that are blue or at least blue adjacent this is an iris tectorum this is one that we collected in China that is much bigger than the, the traditional roof iris. These are roof irises. They grow in shade or sun, um, actually look best in a little bit of shade, but have, the ones we've, we've collected have great big flowers. I really wish we had grown out more, more of the seedlings that we had of this and up to flowering size so we could see them because they are, um, a lot of them are quite different. These have a, this one has this very nice kind of long, narrow beard with spotting on there. Uh, this was a slightly different one that was the beards, uh, the kind of a pale blue. But really, these are probably more lavender than, than blue, purple than blue. And there are other irises that are more blue, but they're all are on that purple side of blue, or mostly are, all of them are. Some of the reticulate irises are a little more blue. Veronica, this is a little ground covering Veronica. At one point, really widely sold in the nurseries, um, usually under, usually as Veronica pedunculosa Georgia blue, but Umbrosa is the correct name. This Georgia blue is from the, the country Georgia, not the state, but you can see this is it. So you can see how light again affects the color. This, I see a little more lavender in this, but when the, the flowers are fresh and bright and just coming out, they really are quite blue. And there are other Veronicas that, that have, that are pretty good blues as well. Speedwell is another name for Veronica. Now, you know, another kind of spreading plant, very similar look to, to the Veronica is this Lithodora. Now, Lithodora, I will say, is can be a bit miffy in our climate. Um, it doesn't really like high humidity. It doesn't like a lot of winter moisture. So you want to plant it on a slope. You want to plant it where there's very, very good drainage and good air circulation to really do its best. But when it's growing well and it's flowering well, it is absolutely spectacular, almost succulent, deep green foliage topped with these, these little blue stars. Really, really a uh, nice plant. And maybe the, one of the easiest on the list, this is Campanula pusharskiana. This is one that's called Blue Waterfall, but I have grown Campanula pusharskiana for a long, long time. And Blue Waterfall looks identical to every other Campanula pusharskiana I've grown. So I I, you know, I don't know that you need the cultivar, but still has more of that lavender look. But what's nice about this is it makes this nice kind of widespreading mat. But then in the winter, it really dies back to kind of a, a single plant and just slowly gets larger and larger. But every year it'll kind of spread out and, and cover itself with flowers. But so it's, it kind of does the effect of a ground cover without actually kind of rooting in and taking over. Over time, it'll, it'll spread to form some mats, but not too bad. And you can see here where it just kind of climbs up through other plants, but doesn't really take over uh, the, their, their space. Another one that's perhaps a little more blue is Campanula garganica Dixon's Gold, which is a yellow-leafed bellflower. Same kind of uh, little star-shaped flowers, but I really like them on top of the, the, the yellow foliage. This is one that if you get it in the right spot, it's great. If you don't get it in the right spot, it can be a little bit, a little bit tough. But this is this whole garden area, this area of this garden, I should say, is kind of a blue and blue and yellow garden. They've got some yellow and blue hostas, this will flower blue, got the yellow corridalis, and then these are this is a 
oh, that's Virginia. Um, I was thinking that was bluebells, but kind of a neat uh, way to do something. I've mimicked it at least a, one part of my garden is kind of that, that blue and gold look. And one of the plants I have in that area of my garden is this sweet Kate Tradescantia or spiderwort. This is a very well-behaved spiderwort, but in try and uh, take over the world. The more sun you get it, the yellower it'll be. Too much sun though in our hot summers and it'll, it'll burn a little bit. So I plant it with some other perennials that will get larger. I have an iris beside it. And so it gets plenty of sun early in the season, but then as the iris grows, the iris really shades it out from intense sun. And then you get these, these blue flowers on there. I love that naturally great combination of, of yellow and blue ish blue ish still not the same color as that that himalayan blue poppy but it's close you know it's harder to get that color in trees um, there are some you know purple flowering trees like that, that approach blue like chaste bush vitex there are some silvery blue leafed plants like this confederate ghost acer leucodermi it has kind of the white speckling over it that gives it this silvery blue look. And of course there's eucalyptus, which again has that silvery blue look. Uh, eucalyptus neglecta is without a doubt the hardiest eucalyptus. There are others that will grow for us that may be taken out with a really cold winter. But if you plant a, this eucalyptus in the spring, it will survive. Now in a cold winter, it might die back to the ground but then it'll come back and do this afterwards and really become kind of this bushy plant. And actually, I like it like this as a cutback shrub where in the spring, I cut it back every year and let it poof out like that. Now, if you put it somewhere where it's, or it lasts long enough to not get hit by the cold, this is what it can do. It can become a really large tree. And you can see how kind of silvery blue that whole outline is. I think that's that's just majestic. Uh, they're kind of interesting. I didn't have a good picture of the adult foliage, but eucalyptus in general, they'll have this rounded foliage, many of them when they're young, and then they will, as they get older, it'll get long and skinny. And that's what this does. So it gives it kind of the, a more wispy appearance as it gets older. You know, sometimes it's not the whole leaf, but just the undersides. This is a a sorbus that we collected in China uh, last year about this time. Sorbus is, um, I'm drawing a blank on the common name for sorbus. Chris, speak up. I'm drawing a blank too, but I'll look it up. <laughs> Rowan's and uh, sorbus, fruiting plants. At any rate. Is it a loquat? No, no, but it looks mean, very similar. How yeah. about Chinese white beam? Oh, that's not the, that's, that's no. not a name we use in the U.S. much. No. I, it'll come to me at some point. But sorbus, they're grown, they're in the rose family. Um, they're trees mostly and they're grown, flowers can be nice, but they're mostly grown for their, their fruit. And they mostly hate our heat and humidity. They, they just, they get fire blight, they get other issues. But this was one we collected growing in an area that'll get very hot and very humid, but also cold. So we think this might be a really good plant. And let me tell you, when you walked under this thing and looked up, it was this, just this umbrella of silvery blue. And then it had nice orange red fruits hanging from it. Spectacular. Uh, we do we're going to have an auction with Chris was talking about our fall symposium. We're, we're going to have an auction with that. Um, and we have one of these to put in that auction. So somebody else will get to try it. We only have a handful of plants from our seed, but, but what we have, we're going to share. So I'm pretty excited that this will wind up being a sorbus that will grow for us. <laughs> it was on the tip of my tongue right there. It almost came out. Oh, well. And now I'm not going to go in depth with conifers. There are a lot of blue conifers here. You can see a uh, blue Colorado spruce, Picea pungens. This is kind of a weeping, crawling one, Glauca prostrata. There's a juniper, um, a blue star juniper with that silvery blue. You know, something you can look for in plant names, both in cultivar and in their species names sometimes is Glauca. 
if you want something that's going to be silvery blue. Uh, glaucous, when you refer to something being glaucous, it means it has a waxy coating on it. And that's where a lot of the blues come from in, in the foliage of plants, especially. Sometimes the fruits as well, but you can take these needles and kind of scratch off some of that waxy coating and uh, not completely in a, a, a blue spruce, but that's, that's where that, that glauca comes from. So there are a lot that do that. You know, they're blue atlas cedars and boulevard false cypresses and, and all kinds of, of great conifers that can add uh, really nice blues to the landscape. There's another one that, that I really like is a podocarp, this podocarp tatara, podocarpus tatara matapuri blue, which I think is, is really uh, nice. Maybe not as intense blue as some other, some other conifers, but it really seems to be a, a, a real uh, very, very good grower for us. Some of the podocarpus tataras can be a little bit iffy, it seems, but this one just has been a great, great grower. And uh, urea. Urea is this weird group that people don't really know very well. They're, they're closely related to camellias, tend to be finer, uh, a little bit finer leaf. This is one called moutiers. It, for years, it was called just green, thinly margined. It got passed around that way, but the, the true name is moutiers. It has this silver leaf, and it makes just kind of a small pyramidal to rounded plant. Flowers aren't very showy, they're small. And unfortunately with most urea, the flowers stink like bad. Like me with my bad sense of smell has looked, literally searched through a garden looking for the dead animal that was in there before realizing that the urea was in flower. It was a different urea than this, it was urea emarginata but still they can kind of smell some. What's very exciting to me is the, the late Alan Galloway here in town, after he passed away, we were helping preserve some of the plants that he had in his garden. I took cuttings of something that I wrote down as Camellia japonica, Ginyo subaki. And I got back and I looked at it and I said, well, wait, this is just Uria mutier, but went ahead and stuck the cuttings of it. Foliage looked exactly like this. Ginyo subaki basically means silver camellia. But I was like, no, this is urea. And then was back in the nursery and looking at it. And lo and behold, it has camellia flower buds on there. So there is a, we're going to have a, be able to distribute this camellia that looks in foliage just like this, but it has actual camellia flowers that presumably don't stink like a urea. So we're pretty excited about, about that plant. They're just a little bit too small to go in this auction that's that's coming up, but soon, soon they will be out. And we have some great natives. Our native father, Gila, uh, can have great, uh, some of those are great blue, like blue shadow, but perhaps the bluest native shrub we have is, is, is Zenobia, dusty Zenobia, Zenobia pulverulenta, which is in the same family as rhododendrons and, and pieris and things like that. Blueberries. Blueberries actually can have some great silvery blue foliage as well. But this is just so intense. I, I you know, it's got these nice big bell-shaped flowers on it. I, that thing would never have to flower. It usually gets great fall color. It would never have to have great fall color, and I would still love this plant. It does best in kind of a moist, well-drained, sunny spot. There are some blue flowered shrubs as well. You know, I mentioned <clears throat> hydrangeas, a close relative of theirs, and some, some botanists actually put them together, is this dicroa, dicroa febrifuga, which has been passed around some. Got these nice blue flowers, a little bit bigger than what you get on a, on a hydrangea for sure. And they can be different, you know, there are different colors of them. This is, you know, a fairly light one with, with darker anthers. And this one is a little bit darker, still with those, those darker anthers. But the exciting thing about them that makes them different from hydrangeas is they get these blue fruits instead of just the dry uh, seed capsules on a hydrangea. They get these beautiful blue fruits. So you really get, you know, an extra season of show. Now, 
usually when somebody has these, they have one and they don't fruit very well for them. And a lot of people have told me over the years that they're, they have separate male and female ones, but I can tell you right now that that is not separate male and female flowers. They're all the parts in there. I think what it comes down to is not having more than one uh, near each other. I think they, they do better when they're cross-pollinated. And I was at the South Carolina Botanic Garden recently at Clemson, and they had this nice big clump. And I'm sure there were different seedlings that had been planted there. And they were getting a great fruit set on there. So I think I'm going to try planting some multiple different ones of these out together. I hope to get better fruit set on there so people can really see how beautiful they are. You know, they're in the wild, a little bit rough looking, but you can see those blue fruits. This is a different species, Yaushanensis, I think. Has a little bit lighter flower color, but the fruit is this crazy iridescent blue. And this is another species that I haven't grown yet, but I saw a lot of this. I've seen this a lot in New Zealand and the West Coast and England. So I really want to try it. That Decroa versicolor, which seemed to have bigger leaf, but that's it in flower. It was, it was beautiful. It wants to stay evergreen, which I think can make it a little bit tricky in cold climates. But if anybody has grown that, let me know after we finish talking about this. I, I'd like to know how, what your experience with it has been. You know, certainly not blue here, but Simplocos paniculata. Now we have a native Simplocos, Simplocos tinctoria, known as horse sugar. Simplocos paniculata is Asian, it's Chinese. And let me tell you, in a bitterly cold, rainy day coming down a mountainside in China and seeing this will absolutely stop you in your tracks. This is the fruit of Simplocos paniculata. It's called sapphire berry. And you can sometimes find it around here. Uh, Camellia Forest sometimes sells it. It's stunningly, stunningly beautiful in, in fruit. I don't know why. I, I don't, I'd have to go back and look at our records. I guess our they didn't germinate because certainly we collected the, the fruit on that. Uh, but beautiful plant. And of course, there are other ways to bring blue into your garden. You can do it with garden ornaments like you know, your chairs. If you were here when Bob Lyons was here, you would know that one of his first rules of landscaping and gardening is to have cobalt blue pots all over the place. This is my little blue and gold bed with my, my blue pig and gold gardenias and sweet cake tradescanches and some, that's that iris tectorum I showed. And this is this is Iris palaceae, which I'm getting ready to dig up and divide and going to share this with the Arboretum. Share it back to the Arboretum. I got it from the Arboretum, but it's not as blue as I want for right there. But you can see how it kind of shades. The sun kind of comes up from this side. It kind of shades my Tradescantia during the, the um, summer. So that's just a start of some blue plants. You know, I did not talk about agaves, didn't talk about a lot of the conifers, tried to stick to things that would grow for us. And there are certainly a lot of other plants with blue flowers and uh, whatnot, but can't talk about all of them. A lot of our bulbs, smaller bulbs, the hyacinths and muscari and things like that, and camacia. I thought I had camacia in there, the, the chemist bulbs that uh, Lewis and Clark lived on on the West Coast. But um, there are a lot out there. So before we get to questions, I want to mention a couple things. Chris mentioned this, Moonlight in the Garden Music Nights. Uh, we're going to have it on November 7th. So this Saturday will be Teacup Gin, which will be fantastic. So for all those who are missing Moonlight in the Garden as much as all of us here at the Arboretum are, you know, this will give you, give you a taste of it. You can um, maybe take your computer or your TV or however you're watching, however you watch it on YouTube Premiere and Facebook. Facebook premiere, you can, you know, maybe roast some marshmallows over your stove or if you got a gas fireplace or something like that. So teacup gin, November 7th, and then to die for on November 21st at, at seven o'clock each, each night. So the, you'll be able to find the link the day of the event on our website. If that is incorrect, uh, what I just said there, I'll be corrected when, when I stop sharing my screen, I'm sure. 
Um, the other thing, a false symposium, Chris mentioned this, that's uh, November 14th. The early registration is, is almost over. There will be a fantastic auction going along with this. That'll be up, I think, on uh, this coming Monday evening. You don't have to participate in the symposium to be able to, to do the, the auction, but um, you'll really miss out if you don't. Uh, the speakers, we've got Dan Bonarsik talking about getting the most out of late season display, and he's up at Chanticleer, and the, be the absolute best time to go see Chanticleer is going into fall, late summer going into fall. They, that's when everything is at its most exuberant. It's, it's amazing. Eileen Boyle talking about the, the Mount Cuba native plant trials. I mean, look, just look at the echinacea trials there. They do such a good job of doing plant trials. I, I save all their stuff with the idea that we, I'd like at some point for us to be doing some, some trials that are along the lines that they're doing. We've got Jim Harbage and Jim Sutton from Longwood Gardens who do their amazing chrysanthemum displays, the, the towers and the globes and everything. They have, they have one they do that's so big that they can't bring it from where they produce it in the nursery through kind of the back way into the, the conservatory. They have to like drive it around the streets to get there and come in through the front gate. It's amazing. Jason Reeves from uh, the University of Tennessee who does these, these very cool kind of upcycled art projects. This is a 40 foot wall of wine bottles. Man, that is so cool. And he must be very dedicated to develop that, to get that many wine bottles. And then Jamaica Kincaid, something a little bit different. She's at Harvard um, University. She's been a longtime writer uh, for The New Yorker. She's, she's an author of, of multiple books. And she's, she's going to be talking kind of a, something to really make you think about <clears throat> what the garden is and, and how, how we interact with it. If you look up, if you have a subscription to the New Yorker, if you look up the disturbances of the garden in the New Yorker, I think it's in August of this year, that'll be kind of the jumping off point for what she's going to talk about. And it's a fascinating read and really excited to, to have her talk because she's thinking on a kind of a larger global scale about what, what gardening, what horticulture is and how it affects our, our history and our future. Fantastic. All right. Stop sharing and answer questions if we have them. Looks like there's quite a few in there. Well, there are a lot of comments, but there were a few questions. Marilyn asked, does the native Simplocus have blueberries? No, it does not have blueberries. I and our native Simplocus is virtually impossible to transplant. It does grow naturally here. And I know people here in Raleigh who have it growing naturally in their, in their woodlands. And it's, it's got little yellow flowers in the spring. It's, it's pretty neat, neat plant, but not blueberries on it. Sue asked or wondered if deer eat dicroa and Mitzi said that they have not eaten hers. Do you know anything or any experience yourself? No, I would have assumed that they eat dicroa. I'm trying to think. I've got young dicroa, and I mine hadn't been eaten, and my my hydrangeas certainly have been stripped. You would think they would treat them just like hydrangeas, but no. Mountain ash. Somebody wrote it. Sorbus. Mountain ash. That's that's. Yep. But yep. we usually know them as, yes. I'm glad that Mitzi agrees with me that mine has, that hers hasn't been eaten either. And Lori had a comment and then just a question. She said I, she finds Iris Tectorum is really, really spready, especially if it ends up where irrigation happens. Anyone else have this problem? I wonder if she has Iris japonica or the japonicum. That one spreads. I banned that one in my yard. So my experience with Iris tectorum is if you have good soil and it's getting plenty of water, it will clump up really nicely, but not like spread. But if you have Iris japonica mm -hmm. or Iris confusa, it 
runs. It, I mean, it really goes. But, but the reason they call iris tectorum roof iris is because where people would see it in Asia, it was literally growing on people's roofs and places like that where it wasn't getting a whole lot of, of water and things like that. Where I collected it was on a dry, rocky hillside, like cliff face and growing up, up there. So, you know, you're kind of missing out on, if you're putting it in a really good spot where something else could, um, could be growing, you know, you're kind of missing out. You can put it in kind of a really tough spot, probably would grow almost as an epiphyte, you know, like on rotten logs or things like that. Yeah. I mean, if my wife would let me, I'd put it up on our roof and let it grow, but I don't think she'd let me. <laughs> I, I have mine out back on a slope next to a large rock underneath a huge white oak and it's never irrigated and it did very well i was very impressed with it no yeah they're um really maryland had, oh yeah i always thought they're really difficult i always thought that they'd rot out if you just had a little bit too much moisture so i avoided them for the longest time mm -hmm. Marilyn asked, does the Amsonia that you show, does that one get the lovely fall color, the gold fall color? In like, a good uh, year, it can get okay fall color. Most years, I just whack it back. It doesn't. Um, so it doesn't not mean, as much. Yeah. Oh, good. So you put that Jamaica Kincaid's articles free. Yeah. Oh, there's zone information. I'm sorry. I, it, if if Louisa has questions about specific plants on zone, I, I will I'll let her know. And Lori, if you want to send a picture of your iris, if you have a picture of your iris, we can tell you if it make you know it, it'll be easy to tell if it's not tectorum. So Marilyn did comment that her iris pectorum does kind of spread but makes a circle and she wasn't sure how to uh, reduce its size it's just a matter of replanting it yeah just just dig it up pull it apart chop it apart with a shovel whatever don't be gentle when you're when you're doing doing this kind of thing and yeah if the, if the center is bare just get rid of anything from the center pull it all out dig it up and replant it and you know you can scatter it around if you want or give it to friends mm -hmm. um, but yeah it will tend to grow good gifts for friends yeah, it's great. You know, if you got an old shed or something like that, throw it up on the roof of that. Um, <laughs> right. I think that was the questions in the chat. Does anyone else have any live live questions for Mark? Now's yeah, your time feel, to get feel them. Free to un, feel free to unmute and ask questions. I wanted to ask you something. Yes. Um, and I'm first off, I'm glad to see you again. Good, glad to see you too. Thank you. I sent you and Chris, and I may have gotten your emails wrong, a picture of a mystery plant I got from the plant giveaway. <clears throat> I was wondering if you got it or do I just need to resend it? It didn't have a tag and it looks like a, looks a little bit like a hydrangea leaf, but I'm not sure. So I yeah. wanted y'all to check it before I plant it. Yeah. <clears throat> If uh, if you send it, I send it again because I didn't see it. We've been the last few weeks while I was doing the poll work, there are a lot of things that got by me, so it may be in my in my inbox. But if you re resend it, that'd be the the easiest thing. And I, yeah, I can't and I can't remember getting one from you, Linda, but I have gotten some from other people. Okay, I may them. have. I may have fat fingered the web dress. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I see no uh, comment about doing some of the bluish conifers, smaller conifers. I could do that. I'm going to share my screen again real quick. People okay. can ask questions, but somebody asked about the plant sale buggy. Oh, good. Am I up? You're up. You're good to go, Mark. All right. So... On the plant sale buggy tomorrow, we've got 
the the giant uh, marlberry, the the Ardesia japonica, great ground cover for shade, spreads thick. Such a good plant. Love that plant. And this has been the the best grower that I've ever done. This Asian lady fern is is absolutely gorgeous. I don't know why we don't have a picture of it, but these real thick textured kind of very ferny fronds. Beautiful, beautiful plant. Deer don't eat it, which is nice. Begonia. Chandler's hardy. Sean Chandler collected it, but it's being sold as Shangri-La now. Probably best to grow this as a house plant for the winter. I've had it out for two winters now. They've been two very mild winters in a very protected spot. It's potentially higher hardy here, but probably not super hardy. Uh, for Fugium Yazaki, wow, on a, this is a double flowered uh, leopard plant, non spotted leaves, plain green leaves, double flowers. Oh, I wish I could show you a picture on my phone right now. I just took pictures of it at my house, I've got a whole big planting of it. It is it is just gorgeous right now in full flower. This cold weather won't bother, bother it at all. Iris nada, the person who was concerned about their iris tectorum spreading too much, you may wanna be careful of this. Iris nada will spread. It's a shade loving iris, get kind of white flowers kind of tinged with a little bit of blue and then the yellow in there, but it does, it does spread to form kind of a nice big stand. A variegated wire vine. This is a little evergreen ground cover that's got leaves that are modeled with white and pink. Very cool. A lot of times people grow Muhlenbeckia axillaris in hanging baskets and things. Probably can't grow it in a hanging basket outside and have it be hardy, but in the ground, it's fine. A gold-leafed oregano. This is a, another ground covering plant. You can use it uh, in a sunny spot, but it stays kind of bright yellow for chartreuse. And then yucca bacata. So this is from Tim's trip last year to Las Cruces, New Mexico. So makes a kind of a, a short, um, a short stalk. Wait, Chris, it was your, your trip too, right? Um, yes, yeah, it was. With, uh, really long, stiff fronds. It's good for putting an eye out, but it's beautiful plant. When it's in flower, it's gorgeous. And uh, it's got edible fruit if you really are hungry mm -hmm. but yeah I mean, oh man yeah. another great list of plants and one that i know i will be buying at least two possibly three of off the cart myself <laughs> Sometimes the cart is out there when I leave on Wednesday and I get a, get a shot at it before, before it gets out on Thursday morning. But there's, yeah. there's at least two out there that I've got some cash in my pocket for. You have the trade secret now, didn't you? You let them know about your trade secret. So there were a couple more questions in the chat and they might all be iris related. Ginny asked that uh, She's read that you should cut irises down to about four inches each, each fall. She's never heard that before. Is this necessary? I don't do that. I usually, I leave them up for the winter and, and then cut back the, if they look ratty, I, I usually cut them back kind of late winter. Was that mm -hmm. the, the question? Yeah, she, she just asked kind of irises overall. I think there's some irises that don't even really have a presence in, in the winter time. So you can cut them back. Right to the ground and yeah, some of I them just, seem to grow really well i just i cut them back when the foliage looks ratty before new foliage starts in the spring so yeah and Lori has a question about tulips in pots do does she need to put them in the garage here or can she leave them outside sheltered from rain during the winter oh they'd be much happier outside 
Yep. The cooler they are, the better. All right, Louise, I'm going to get to you with some zone stuff. There, let's see. Oh, one other thing about irises. A lot of the iris folks, like iris society, will tell you to divide your iris in the fall and replant, you know, down to like a single fan and replant. And then they say it won't flower the next year, but the year after that it'll flower. Divide them immediately after flowering, replant them, they will flower next year for you. And every time I tell people, and I used to fight with people in the iris society about that, and they'd say, no, don't, that's not how you're supposed to do it. I'm like, but why would you skip a year of flowering? And when I do that, when I divide them right after flowering, if they need dividing, I do cut the foliage back uh, then just because otherwise it kind of flops around. Any secret to growing Iris Cristata powder blue giant? I would not be surprised if they did, if you did drown those. If you ever see Iris Cristata growing in the wild, they are growing on, like if you're on a walk in, in the Appalachians, you go from kind of, you know, the, the cool damp side where you've got some uh, roadies and azaleas and things growing. You come out and you go around and all of a sudden it's dry and kind of rocky. That's where you see the Iris Cristata. And we always, people always say they're like shade plants, but really they like, they like more sun and they do great like under the roots of trees. So if you have like an area where you have a tree and the sun shines down and gets it for at least a good chunk of the day, but, but it's hard to grow because of all the roots, plant them there, that's great. I've got some at my house right on top of a rock wall and they're spreading like, like great. It, they, they do not want to be too wet. That is definitely the biggest issue with them. Is the oregano edible? Maryland. Yes, it is. Is the leopard plant a shade plant? Yes, it is. Although you can put it in full sun. Do I cut the Algerian iris in fall so the flowers show up better in the winter? When the Algerian iris, iris unguiculatus flowers and it's nestled down in the foliage, I always think, wow, I should have cut my foliage back in the fall. I never do, but <laughs> yes, they would probably show up much better that way. So let me see. So some some information about zone for somebody who's who's a little bit farther away, which I forget about with these these Zoom things that I can get people from farther away. Uh, some of these, so the dicroa are zone six. I, I, I would be pushing it. I think they might be die back. Um, they might die back to the ground in in zone six. Urea that's a good question. I don't know how hardy they are. That was Yuria Japonica, right? Yeah, I've never grown it older than zone six. The Trigonotus um, omiensis, no clue how hardy that is. I, I think it grows pretty high on Mount Ome, so I would think zone six but not sure about that. The Georgia Blue Veronica, very hardy. That's probably zone five. The Lithodora, I think if it's kept dry, it's probably pretty hardy, but I'm not certain about that. Missouri Botanic Garden lists zone eight to 11 for the urea, so probably not much colder than us. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see you're uh, zone 8B. Oh, you, should, you can grow any of these things, except for maybe the, the Picea. That may be something you, you don't do. Oh, yeah. Lake Pontchartrain. Oh, man, I used, to go to, I used to go down to Lake Pontchartrain when I was a kid. And that was the first roller coaster I ever rode was at Lake Pontchartrain. My family's all from New Orleans. Oh. Let's see. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, you can do all these things in, in Louisiana. Let's see, anything? There was, oh, somebody asked me privately about the, the Colocasia. 
send me an email if, if anybody wants some of the, that Caucasia phalax and I'm, I'm, when you send it, I'm going to put you in a, put the email in a folder. And when I get around to digging up and dividing the, the Caucasia, I'll get back with you. How's that sound? Sounds good. I, I kind of laughed when you offered that because I just kind of was thinking of Bryce's class when he offers up a plant to usually gets in trouble because he doesn't have enough. Yeah, well, it'll be first come first. Jim just commented. Jim just commented. Thanks for including any plants for six zone six <laughs> and colder. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, you, you, no private messages on here for college age. You're gonna have to go to our website and find my my email address. I'm the only mark that works here, so you have to do it that way. Because otherwise, I will never in a million years remember. <laughs> But yeah, I, I love sharing plants. So, and and the colocasia was was shared shared with to me, but shared with me by a, a gardening friend here in town. So, I'll be happy to pass it on. It's always a nice thing to do. Yeah. Well, I see no more questions in the chat. No one speaking up, Mark. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. It's been fun. Yep. Thank you. And thank you, Mark, for a great presentation. You are welcome. Thank you. See you next week. See you next week. Thank you. Good night. Bye, everybody. Thanks Bye, so much. Bye. Thank you. Enjoyed it again. Thanks. <laughs>